everybody, this is Talia. And this is Ahana, and you're listening to the 5th Period Podcast. Hello everyone, and welcome back to 5th Period, the film podcast hosted by two media teachers, where this week our episode is wrapped in plastic, and that's fantastic. Yes, we have an absolute Barbie bonanza for you today, and boy are we excited. My name is Mr. Brown, and with me as always is... Someone who's not excited, even though he's getting labelled it. It is Mr. Whittle. I mean, uh, we've got to put up a good front, right? <laughs> well, we've got to start strong because who knows where it goes to from here. Yes, it was a slog getting through this film. We're going to talk about it in more detail, but oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I watched it last night. I don't know about you. I think you were I last night as well. I very late last and night. And I'm still reveling 24 hours later as to losing an hour and 20 minutes of my time so i imagine you're probably gonna roast this film today uh i've got some things to say on it i was hoping for a roast so that i could say throw another shrimp (laughs) on the barbie (laughs) yes very good (laughs) fun's coming early (laughs) that's it as i said we've got to start strong because we know it's going downhill on top of our breakdown of barbie princess charm school we will also have our very first double student appreciation Mm. and our regular weekly watches and tantalizing trailer segments so if you want to skip to any of those I will leave time codes in the description below. I recommend skipping to them (laughs) for this particular episode. We're going to have some good content. It's just going to be in those other sections. Yeah, that's very true. Look, I'm expecting to get big numbers for our listeners this week. We had so many enthusiastic attendees at Film Club on Friday that they had to form a barbecue. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> two for two. Um, I loved Film Club on Friday, albeit it's a shame that it came about because of such a piece of work. But yeah, it was really nice having that many people in the room. Uh, I had some good banter with some students I don't normally get to talk to. Oh, yeah? Normally I um, just sit up the front and talk with the year 12s, but being able to talk to Ethan and Harry and a few other of the year 10s, that was nice. You know, yeah. there's some good people that come along to Film Club every week. Mm, And look, I'm not expecting equal numbers for our listeners to the podcast, but I feel like if you are listening, since we followed through on recording this one for the fans, the least people could do is give us a like and subscribe. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Alrighty, now today for Student Appreciation, we have our very first double appreciation. Two intros for the price of one. A double feature. Talia and Ahana did our joint intro today because... They actually did a joint presentation at Film Club. It was so lovely to have the the surprise. I will put it out there that it was a bit of a surprise. So the technology that I could offer them to put their presentation up was not as planned as I would have liked to be. So sorry, guys, for that one. But they persevered. They did. I I just love having people that are that enthusiastic about any film, even if it's a film that I don't like. And for Talia and Ahana to come forward with a riveting presentation, very (laughs) thorough to the point where like you couldn't read some of the words. There was so much on the uh, (laughs) content in there. Um, A great presentation about why we should be watching Scott Pilgrim versus the world in film club. Yes. Now I love Scott Pilgrim versus the world. As do I. And if I didn't, this presentation would have surely got me on board. Yes. Yeah. Um, So they, they did a great job. Really love the, the enthusiasm. I love that we had such a welcoming environment in the whole room. Oh, cheers but, after every slide. Yep, yeah, just like the, it just warmed my heart. So thank you guys. Thank you also for your podcast uh, startup. What would you call it? Podcast, uh, podcast intro. Intro would be the common terminology. Yeah, yeah and yeah. just continued support at Film Club Weekly. So thanks heaps, guys. Thanks. All righty, let us jump into Barbie Princess Charm School. If we have to. Oof. All right, so first, I need to preface with the Barbie-verse. Now, you've been told a couple of times that you need to explore the Barbie-verse. I can tell you for a fact that's not the case. Oh, I was well aware that I was being <laughs> trolled, yeah. But one thing that is, I don't know if interesting is the right word, one thing that might be somewhat relevant to how we look at this film today, there is a film in the Barbie-verse where it's revealed that Barbie is an actress who is appearing in all of these different roles. Yeah. So Barbie Princess Charm School, she's playing Blair, but it's actually an actress, Barbie, in the role of Blair. I did, like, that was the conclusion I came to that was never explained to me at the start of just watching this product by itself. But yeah, the the assumption was made that Blair is Barbie in that world, I guess. You just made that assumption. It's a pretty complex piece of cinema, this one. (laughs) Well, well, it's a product that's called Barbie something, like whatever it is. Barbie needs to be in it in some way. I, I was surprised that they don't just 
call Blair Barbie. Like the new movie, hi Barbie, hi Barbie, yeah. everyone's Barbie, That's right? That's true. So they, you don't need new names. Yeah. Well, there are films that exist in the Barbie universe where she is called Barbie, and those ones are assumed to be taking place outside of the films that she's Oh, doing. okay. Well, that makes more sense. So, so maybe to understand that new level of nuance, I do have to go watch all the other Barbie Look, films. you better watch them all. Yeah, it won't be happening. <laughs> Let's talk up front about the animation style. Mm, that's a good point. That one, to me, is maybe one of my least favourite things about the film. Yeah, it's pretty kind of rudimentary, yeah? Like, it's just not got any kind of slickness to it. When was this made? 2011? Yes. Yeah. So it's not like it's well off into the ages of animation and then, you know, we expect it to be a bit, how's it going? Mm -hmm. You know, like obviously budget limitations. They like churn they, a lot of these films out in very quick succession. So I'd imagine they'd be using a, a type of animation style that's quite easy to make their way through quickly. Yeah, uh, I think that there's a certain generic element to the way things move in it and stuff like that. You just have the body movement is kind of dressed it's like the avatar style where you, you create the character on a, a base body mm -hmm. and we see that a lot through the movie where the, the movement of characters is quite generic in nature there were moments when the movement looked odd and i wondered are they trying to make it look like they're limited to move like dolls yeah is maybe. that kind of what they're going for sure i'll, I'll be we'll be told that that is correct that is yeah, what they, it was all deliberate <laughs> um yeah so let's you think uh, we're gonna get a lot of feedback on this yeah one. there's that as well keep those comments coming guys all Alright, so it opens with Blair working in a cafe, and the song that's playing, it goes, You can tell she is a princess. Spoilers, am I right? <laughs> you can tell she's a princess. She doesn't need a crown. The I gotta reveal. say, the songs, there's two, three songs throughout the film. The two that I remember, they were suitable to the product. Like, they, they weren't. But you think the product is shit? Yeah. <laughs> So you're saying the songs were shit? They're in a sense, but also not. Like, they didn't bother me because they're, it's like, it's it, what should be as part of that product. So they weren't distracting for me. They seemed suitable to the narrative and suitable to the tone that they're trying to set at the start. So you even liked the one right at the end where she was spinning her tunes? No, because I wouldn't remember what happened at the end. <laughs> By that point, you'd yeah, fall asleep. Yeah, yeah, or making dinner or something. So Blair goes home and may I say her younger sister, Emily, might be the most annoying character ever put to screen. Who's a lady royal? Blair's a lady Emily, royal. Emily, that's not Who possible. Who works in the palace? Blair works in the palace. Uh-huh. Those guys at home, uh, the mother, Emily and Blair, gave me Hunger Games vibes. Where's Peter? Oh my God, Peter! Peter! Peter. Where's Peter? Peter. 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 Peter! Peter! So, um, oh, okay. you, like the, the whole Well, they dynamic. do have the big lottery where then she's entered into that it. that further gave the Hunger Games vibes. Yeah, yeah. So um, the, the family dynamic, albeit it's different, but like um, the strong older teenage sister, um, the mum and the younger daughter. Yeah, so I, I felt like a uh, correlation between the, this family setup of Hunger Games um, and this. On par in terms of quality of film as well. <sighs> Did that side get picked up on the mic? I think so, yeah. yeah. It was one of the loudest sides I've ever heard. I don't really get the lottery. There were real princesses who attend a magical princess school, but then each year there's a lottery to work at the school as a, as a lady royal. Is that a prize? Yeah. So uh, you could be a lady royal like a servant. Wait, is the lady royal different to the princess? I believe so. They're the second in command, like the assistant. Oh, princess. yes, because... Um, thing that becomes a lady royal at the end. Delancey, yeah. I believe, yeah, yeah, is the, yeah, the yeah, character. Yeah, 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 the thingy. Yeah, yeah. Thingy. <laughs> thingy. They, I don't know, like, a hierarchy. Like, maybe that's what this movie is. It's a, it's a commentary on the hierarchical um, class system where um, mm. the ability to hold people down through the, the regiment of official roles. Yeah, mm. yeah. Well, like yeah. I said, a complex piece of cinema. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, anyway, Blair wins the lottery and then a limo driver immediately turns up to her door. I feel like that was rigged. Yeah, yeah, I mean... Emily's enthusiasm for this whole competition speaks to child marketing. So it's actually a meta commentary on Mattel and, you know, being a, a product, uh, a product yeah. wielding company. So to have Emily so enthralled by the idea of someone winning this seemingly frivolous role of 
being showered in diamonds and, you know, being held in the castle. She wants to, to win. She's so passionate about it that she enters her sister in not once, but six times a week for the last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're going to come in with all these really insightful, in-depth analyses of the film... I'm going to be reduced to fun little tidbits. Did, <laughs> we, we, did you we, notice the limo driver play. sounded a bit like the Gogo Mobile guy? <laughs> and how would that sound? Problem with my Gogo Mobile. G O G G O. Gogo Mobile. Oh, don't worry, Al. That sound bite's coming. <laughs> I, I mean, I can. I can G O G G O. <laughs> I got a oh, problem with my Gogo Mobile. That was one of my favorite ads. Let, let's do a podcast just talking about old. Anything to get out of this one, eh? (laughs) Not happy, Jan! But yeah, so Blair goes to Princess Charm School, still in her stained shirt and apron from work. Couldn't give her a minute to get changed. Mm. Unbelievable. But yeah, they go from the the classic castle to like the Barbie Dreamhouse School. Yes. And I understand that's for your demographic, but I like the classic castle look better. I feel like for the type of school that it is, like it's royalty. My favourite was when they go to that new age kind of area we have the state of the art everything including a classroom they actually say a classroom for the entire school one classroom yeah yeah that is state and of then the they art. switch to going and we also have this whole dancing academy and all these other things yeah. it's like yeah but you don't have you only got one classroom that's not really state of the art maybe it is maybe the future of schools is only having one classroom. well that's for traditional classes they they have 25 book balancing rooms mm. yeah the important skills you know <laughs> so the fairies yes they don't add anything to this film do they they add the ability to just miraculously have things appear when you need them to within your narrative but for the most part they don't do anything no so they don't do anything for the sake of the narrative but they also just don't do anything for the sake of the characters like if you immerse yourself in the world they're useless sometimes they bring you things but yeah. you could just go get your things you could also just say here's a cupboard with those things in it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah 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 i have been told though that even though this is a film within barbie's world mm. in the actual barbie universe there are also fairies <laughs> oh, so the right. magic isn't just in her films there's magic in the barbie oh, okay well. so just because it's canon like, yeah, 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 exactly yeah, right. Yeah, we need fairies in it. <laughs> so we meet Delancey, the, the bully of the school, and her airhead friend, Portia. Look, Delancey, they're serving floor cakes. I missed this. Can you explain to me how Delancey and her mother are already active participants in the school running? Are they not in contention? So, to no, be... Delancey's in contention to be the next princess. Right. And her mother, because Delancey's at the top of the ranks in terms of being the princess of that area, that region, her mother has assumed a role of power. Kind of like the ultimate stage mum. Okay, yeah. That makes sense again with the Hunger Games analogy, like the districts. Mm. Yeah, she she's of a richer district. Well, I assume it's districts, because otherwise, how could there be that many princesses? Yeah. And when they're all graduating, I think they even say, you're going to be the princess of this region. Right. So area managers, basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The locker is almost exclusively there for makeovers. Yeah. Yep. I don't know how comfortable I'd feel getting changed behind that tiny little curtain. <laughs> just in, in the corridor. If you've got five fairies giving you a hand, maybe that's enough, right? That's true. Yeah, but she yeah. only had the one. She only I, had the one fairy. And even that was enough for... Old Blair. Mm, I don't know if it was enough. Did you see that side pony? No, I didn't oh, see it. Her hair's down, but she's just got a random side ponytail there. Uh. Side pony? <laughs> Blair meets her princess roommates, and I know you would have loved this part, where she kicks the soccer ball and it bounces around the room and then starts dancing on the shoes. Yeah. 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 That's your favourite part of the movie, yeah? <laughs> That's what I expect all soccer balls to do. Yeah. I'm disappointed when it doesn't happen on the turf here. Look, you've been taking the lead on making insightful points about the film, but it was at this point in the film that I realised it passes the Bechdel test. Oh, yeah, that's a given. Yeah. And, like, that's probably speaking to the advocacy around getting this film put forward to us, that students that are connecting with this film, I get why they're connecting with this film Mm. because it speaks to them as a particular type of audience. They are the target audience. Anyone who doesn't know the Bechdel test, it's how often in a media product of any kind, namely like a film or TV show, two female characters talk to each other about something other than the male 
Mm. Yeah. Um, this certainly passes that. Like, like oh. Pretty much all conversation. There's is, hardly a male in it. Yeah. There's that one scene where they're dancing with the guys, but then they're not seen again until the end of the film. Much like the Greta Gerwig Barbie, they're just sort of side characters yeah. for yep. them. And Accessories almost. I, I liked that correlation was there between this 2011 film mm -hmm. um, and what the 2023 Barbie movie presented the kins of the world. They're superfluous to success and mm -hmm. aspirations and personality. Yeah, so I, I can totally get, even though I don't like this film myself, I understand the appeal. Oh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I did get a lot of joy on Friday, just in the atmosphere of it. Yeah. With people really engaging with the film. You said yourself that you felt like it was one of the weeks where people weren't just kind of chatting amongst themselves. They were actually watching the film. Yep. They were really invested yeah. in what was happening. Yeah. So that's good. Like, I'm, I'm glad in that regard. Another thing that kind of came across, I don't know if I'm jumping too early into it, but there's a point in the film where they talk about what makes a good princess. Mm-hmm and the value of character as, yep. as, as something a point of difference you can have all the intelligence in the world but it's character that gets you across mm -hmm. because character is innate to you being an individual and like you demonstrating your individuality and like they really kind of spruik that in the film no one can make you feel inferior not without your consent i thought that was a nice message so did i but i did think that it conflicted with the actual tests that they had to do yeah. to be a princess. Oh, yeah. You have to be an individual, but everybody has to pass this test in the exact same way. So the balancing the books on the head and the being able to make a good cup of tea. I'm not sure how balancing things on your head is a measure of a good princess or a lady royal. If you stumble, if you hesitate, you can kiss the crown goodbye. Now, if I told you once, I've told you a thousand times, boys counts. It's just as important as the others. Swimsuit, evening wear. Talent, boys! <laughs> it's a measure of physics of a good uh, lady, pr lady princess. Lady royal or princess. <laughs> yeah, Let's get the terminology yeah, right. Sorry, I wanted that clarified. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, yeah. She does subvert expectations later on, though, so we'll get mm -hmm. to that. But, um, yeah, at this stage, she is still trying to comply with what, on paper, makes a good princess slash lady royal. Yeah, yep. yeah. Delancey asks if she got her shoes at a garage sale. Burn! Yeah, that's throw another shrimp on the barbie. Mm. But I was confused because they're all wearing the same clothes at this point in the film. Yeah. So did Delancey also get her shoes as a garage sale? <laughs> well, no, no. Delancey throws her shoes out after one wear. Right. Thinking that everyone else and then who Blair gets the same purchased shoes, them. that's right. Right, yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, it's funny you said that, because I actually had the note solid burn there. There you go. <laughs> so Dame Devon cracks it at Blair because, and we don't realise this until later, but she realises that Blair is the rightful heir. Mm. Uh, and so she cracks it at her and becomes a real hard ass on her. Yeah, this is where the character conversation comes in eventually as well. Like, Dame Devon is initially presented as someone who maybe is against Blair, but mm. ultimately kind of comes to the point of... Wanting her to succeed? Dame Devon never wants her to succeed. Dame Devon's uh, Delancey's mum. Okay, see, I'm already confused. No, the, you're thinking of Miss Privet. Miss Privet, I'm sorry. Yes. Anyway, cut all that. <laughs> no, no, we're going to keep it in there. The nitty gritty. They're going to be wanting us to get those characters right. <laughs> Quality content. I think Portia might be up there as one of my favourite characters. Uh, which one's Portia? So, the airhead friend. Oh, you stepped on eight of my toes. I only have four left. Ah, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, so I decided it when she's trying to explain about uh, the cake. Uh, never mind. I'll put the sound bite in. It'll... <laughs> you stole my cake. Not me. Blair. How dare she? I, I warned you that, like, my ability... Like, so for this film, like with every film, I do sit down with the intention of just giving it my um, utmost attention mm -hmm. so that I can be thorough with this podcast, whether I liked it or not. Watching this, I struggle. I would find myself just mentally diverting to something else and going, hang on a second, you've got to pay attention. I just struggled to pay attention in this film. That's yeah. fair. It is? That you struggled to pay attention. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Because uh, <laughs> I did. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll rattle through a couple of points then. Yep. We found out that Blair was left on her mum's doorstep. Yes. And then that leads us into the first dance scene. So before the boys actually join them, they do like a practice dance scene. And we see Blair is stepping on people's toes. And 
To me, it frustrated me how clumsy they made her character. Unrealistically clumsy. Well, it's not unrealistic when all they have to do is like make those weird cartoons just move around randomly. That's what they did. It looked very clumsy. But, but it wasn't only Blair that looked clum clumsy. True, every but character Blair clumsy. is ridiculously clumsy. Like everything that she can stuff up, she does. Uh. So she spills tea on herself and then the lipstick and then she bumps into people. She drops things. And it was at this bump and there's plenty more after this. But at this bump, I went, how did she ever run the cafe? Mm. She must have been spilling stuff on herself all the time. And especially since later on, one of the major skills she can't do is make a cup of tea. She worked in a cafe. She should be able to make a cup of tea. And they showed that montage at the very start of the film, this one I do remember, where mm. she seemed very competent at working at a cafe. Yeah. It wasn't like she was slack at it. Like she was working very well. To suddenly then not have the basic skills to make a cup of tea, contradictory. And that was it. She wasn't clumsy in that opening. That's how you could tell she's a princess. Yeah. You can tell she's a princess. She'll turn the world around. Yeah. Yep. Put that soundbite in. <laughs> uh, okay, so the montage music is amazing. So when she's actually going through and she's like, no, I need to develop my skills at this. And she's balancing books and she's like standing, doing like the uh, crouching yeah. tiger, hidden dragon pose. Yeah. The montage music is so good. The songs in this movie are so literal. <laughs> like at the point where she's trying to balance something, it's like singing about, I don't have the balance. I don't have the balance. Think I'm gonna fall. Stuff like that. I, like, could, th I could think of a better literal song for a montage though. Well, it reminded me of Team America, that's why. Right. right. And I'm so glad that this is our third podcast where we've got to put that soundbite awesome. in. Every reference or montage. Yeah, 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 so good. So both of those montages side by side. One day we'll be able to do a montage of our references to montage. So good. Yeah. So then we get the dance scene with the boys and Blair has to sit out so that Delancey can have her partner who looks like Austin Powers. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Uh, he's got that lisp mm. as he talks. But despite him having that lisp, he still knows how to get down when the song turns into some sort of <laughs> hip hop rendition of their waltz. <laughs> So this was when I truly giggled at the animation. So like funny. the dancing was crazy. Yeah. And Blair gets paired up with Nick Carter from the Backstreet Boys. All right. Yeah, what a hunk. Good. Isn't that what commonly happens at like the formals of high schools? I don't know about the formals at high schools, but I'm pretty sure that's standard protocol at Princess Charm School. Right, I need, yeah. to, I need to do Brush a transfer. Brush up on you, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. It reminded me of, have you seen A Knight's Tale with Heath Ledger? I feel like I have. So there's a scene where they're doing like a really classical dance and then Golden Years by David Bowie plays. Yeah. And then their dance becomes like super modern. Yeah. It reminded me of that. Obviously, just much, much worse. <laughs> uh, but in terms of tonal shifts, it was spot on. And the group goes back to their room and all of their uniforms have been torn to shreds. Yes. But it's okay because despite how clumsy she is, Blair is an expert at sewing and can put tattered clothing into brand new outfits that are different patterns, different material and different colors to their original outfits. And not just different, like based on the compliments they get, assumedly much better as yeah. well. Like, so yeah, that, that's pretty impressive skills. Haha, <laughs> well, in fact, they are the original uniforms. So she is uh, not following expectations at this point. So ah, it, it, is, it is a turning point within the narrative, yeah. 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 They're wandering through the halls, and Princess Isabella is on a big picture, and it looks identical to Blair. So they discover that Princess Isabella must have been Blair's mother. And when they got into a car accident, apparently Blair survived. I don't know how. 
She survived. Someone stumbled upon her and then dumped her at a random person's house mm. on their doorstep. Yes. They don't dwell on that point too much because I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense. If you saw that there was a car crash and you saw that a baby had survived the car crash, would you go over, take the baby out of the car and go put it on someone else's doorstep? <laughs> it doesn't I make a whole lot of sense, hey. Is that the first thing you'd do if you found a baby in need? Like, yeah. Like yeah. Go, well, it's got to go somewhere. somewhere. I'll put it on this doorstep. <laughs> <laughs> but I like in this moment, they show Delancey watching. And at first it seems really sinister that she's watching. But then she gives this facial expression and you think, Maybe she didn't know. Mm. 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 So she might not be as sinister a character as we once thought. Blair pours scalding hot tea on Portia, and she just goes, Hey! Biggest underreaction I've ever seen. <laughs> I'm just rattling through things now. I'll bounce when I can bounce. All right, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so just when Blair's about to give up, because Delancey's mum just keeps telling her she's no good and that she has to get out of there, Prince the dog gives Blair a picture of the baby, of the royal family, and she decides she's going to fight for her position. Mm. I've just had a thought. So Prince is assumedly a male dog. So mm -hmm. subservient within the world of Barbie as well. Oh, yeah, I see. like so kind of symbolic of the role that males have within the Barbie world. It's an insight. It's a bit of a stretch. I'm trying for something here. Prince is the only one that's royalty from the start of the film. Everyone else is trying to earn it. Yes, this is true. So yeah. he actually does have the position of authority. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hot take. Controversial. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I've always thought, though? The most effective way to inform people that there's a fire is to do so through a cheerleading chant. Yeah. You've always thought that too, right? That's how we run fire drills at the school. Yeah, we yeah, take out our yeah. pom-poms yep. and we do a chant. Yes. The fire drill as a plot point, though, feels pretty pointless to me. Immediately afterwards, they get accused of stealing the jewellery anyway, mm -hmm. so they get locked away. Yep. So what was the point of the fire Was it drill? enough time for Dane Devlin to, to plant, plant the, the evidence? Jewelry, yeah. oh, I see. Yeah. Although I she's see. got a, that lackey, the, the driver, who also seems to be the person You who, mean Gogo Mobile guy. Go, yeah, Gogo Mobile guy. He also seems to be the one who knew exactly where the jewelry was hidden. Here's some, and here's some. Like, he, he knew exactly where it was. So it's I reckon he suspicious. did the planting as well. I feel like the headmistress, what did I say her name was? Miss Privet. I feel like she knew that it wasn't them either. You can tell by the way she acts through that scene that she knows and she's like, oh, so disappointing when Delencia doesn't tell the truth about it. Yeah. Yes. But, yeah, that, that's it. But she still lets yeah. them get taken away. Yep. Awful she does headmaster. say something like, based on the evidence, I have to do it or something like that. She but doesn't the, have She's the headmistress. That's she right. Have to do uh, yeah, anything. Just, just stand up, be the tough person in the room and just like make the call. Mm. But like, yeah, she certainly does infer through the look to Delancey, she's onto her. Yes. But then Delancey gets her big change of the film. Yes. We Delancey her true colours. Uh, brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant's a bit strong. Uh, that's too much. <laughs> um, but I didn't think her character change made complete sense. I mean, I get that throughout the film we can see at times that she's kind of getting a lot of pressure from her mother. Mm -hmm. Right? You need to do this, you need to do that. And she does when her mum tells her. But the very first time we meet her, her mum's not around and she's just a bully. Mm. She's just an awful person. So I don't think that character change is completely justified. It's not like she was great the entire time, but she was just forced into a difficult position. She was pretty mean when we are first introduced to her. Maybe she's conflicted and coming to terms with the really ingrained kind of behavioural traits that have come from having her mum for the first 15, 20 years. But she is self-aware to the point where she wants to change. You need a character to show learning because Barbie's, well, Blair, sorry, is already perfect, isn't she? Like, if we need a character to demonstrate the learning that occurs... She's not perfect. She's pretty clumsy. No. Yes, this is true. But enough to be a princess. <laughs> but that's the whole point. You don't have to be perfect. Anyone can be a princess. In, the, in a metaphorical way. Blair does learn that because she is a reluctant participant and then she does through persevering and, and getting the job done, learn that. Yeah, hmm. yeah. And she says that when she's like making the big announcement at the end, she's like, anyone can be a princess. Yeah. She goes, not really though. I'll be the real princess and I'll stay here. In it would have been really cool if she said anyone can Barbie a princess. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Barbie, oh, very whatever good. you want to be. 
I loved it when they broke in to get the crown and there's a laser alarm and one of her friends goes, oh, it's a laser alarm. We've got one of these at home. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I'm like, if I had one of those at home, I'd be totally pretending to do like the laser yeah, um, yeah. skip through. Like, you know, just practicing whether I could do it. What's the, um, the Angelina Jolie film where she like navigates her way underneath it? Entrapment. Entrapment. That's but what yeah, uh, Sean I, Connery. In it is the, the one with yeah, Sean Connery. Like one of his the, last films. Talk about age gaps. Mm, yes. This was pretty funny when she flips her way through it and then it cuts back to the friends and they're awkwardly just like squatting and crawling under it. Yeah. That was pretty good. Yeah. I enjoyed that. It was unbelievable though that the, the powder puff and the temporary powder that they kind of give from the makeup powder lasted, that lasted long. long enough to see the lasers through. I don't know. Some of the advertisements from Maybelline these days, that makeup will last... 48 hours. Oh, maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's Maybelline. Maybe it's lasers. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, I see. It's a metaphor for laser surgery. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I like that they go and they're like, oh, no, we don't have the code to it. What's the prompt? The day it all began. <laughs> Dame Devon catches them. She takes the crown off them and then she locks them in the vault. Presumably leaving them for dead, right? Or at least until they stop being so naughty. Well, I don't know. We find out that Dame Devon's pretty dark. She yeah. killed the queen, so spoilers. Yes. Um, no, we haven't done spoiler warning. Sorry, guys. We haven't done a spoiler warning. To ruin I'll be surprised film. if they're still listening to this yeah. point. <laughs> so it cuts to the coronation day. And the coronation day announces are having an absolute ball. They're like, oh, it's the best time of year, people. I'm not talking about my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Again, though, that reminds me of, oh, he's such a great character as well. Stanley Tucci's character in Hunger Games. Oh, yeah. Um, Tucci, Tucci. Yeah, <laughs> he is awesome. And, like, the enthusiasm that he has for the games in itself, that, that reminds me of that. Have you noticed that Delancey, with her hair down, looks exactly like Blair? It's amazing that no one thought she was the long lost child of the queen. They did look very similar. One's in like a purple tartan outfit, one's in a pink tartan outfit. But yeah, they get out of the vault by using the keypad on her phone somehow. Pretty impressive. That reveal is hilarious. Especially it's like, 2011. If only we had a keypad. Maybe we do. She just lifts up her phone. I didn't mind the fact that her friend is so proficient in music knowledge that she could identify the notes. I yes. didn't mind that. Yeah, That's yeah, kind of yeah. cool. We've got friends that can do that. Hi, Stu. He is not listening no, to this. I know, right? <laughs> but yeah, Delancey makes up a bunch of protocols to buy some time while they're trying to get out of there. But then she points to them in the book. So these protocols do actually exist? <laughs> It's they're just, pretty ridiculous if they do. Yep. And if they do, why has no one heard of them before? They're just distraction techniques. Like you know, looking or oh, look at these words on the paper, though. You know, and if I read them, then you are further distracted. And now we must hop on one foot to one of those who have hopped before us. <laughs> That's a pretty funny line. Blair stops the ceremony just at the last minute, um, and Delancey gives over the crown, and her mum ends up confessing in front of everyone in front of the cameras too she murdered the queen mm. this is a trope of kids films that someone will just like announce that they've done something like this at the end so that everything can be wrapped up with a neat little bow oh it makes sense because that one fact is now revealed yeah exactly yeah yeah she could have gotten away with it mm. if it weren't for those meddling kids yeah it's really one of those isn't it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> She gives her final inspiring speech and makes Delancey her lady royal, which to me didn't make any sense. Number one, Delancey's a princess, not a lady royal, so there's a bit of an inconsistency there. And there's also about a hundred other people more deserving than Delancey. That, that one really stuck with me. Like, I get that Delancey is meant to exemplify character come good, mm. you know, when they were previous antagonists, but Blair's got... Better friends. She had like, two friends that were locked in the cupboard with her and <laughs> been on this whole journey with her. They would have been standing there outraged. Yeah, I would have. Uh, rightly so. So, mm. yeah. I, and I, what about her sister? Now that everyone can be a princess, why can't her sister be a lady royal? Well, doesn't her sister automatically become a princess? Doesn't um, Emily say that to her? Am I a princess now too because we're going to live here? And she says, yes, you are. So She might have. Yeah, I, I, I think like, I was yeah, out yeah, by yeah, that yeah. point. Princess by proxy. Yeah. But yeah, I'd be pissed if I was her friend. Mm. I agree. That's not a hot take. I'm sure everyone who watched agrees with us on that. Yeah, point. yeah. Unbelievable. Undeserving um, Delancey. 
Now I have to slot in the, here's a special track I wrote myself. I hope you like it. I did not like it. It was a garbage way to end the film. Yeah, I was definitely out just doing other things around the house. Imagine holding off on showing your music to the world that long, only to reveal a track that awful at the most public event. I feel like we need a little snippet of the song into the podcast. Oh, it'll be there. It'll be there. But yeah, Blair's sister and mum just turn up. She didn't send for them. They, they just turned up on their own. She'd forgotten all about them. She's Did the go-go go movie go get her? Probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That brings us to the end of, of Bob A. Princess Charm School. Mm-hmm. The Blair Willows Project. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, as soon as that name popped up, that reference came into my mind. You know the whole throw another shrimp on the Barbie thing? Mm. I thought of that one when I was watching Margot Robbie in the Barbie movie as an Australian. Ah, yes. They must have, surely some interviewer has like talked to her about Barbie, you're Australian, that Barbie. I don't think they have. They haven't drawn the connection. I think I'm the only genius who's come <laughs> up with it. Very good. <laughs> Alrighty. So I know you're not a big one for uh, star letterbox ratings, but if you had to rate this one on letterbox, what would you give it? I will segue from that question into the conversation I had with Ollie at lunchtime. Ollie asked me if I'd watched it yet. And I said, yes, he goes, but you haven't put it on Letterboxd. I'm like, I refuse to. I'm not even logging this on Letterboxd. It is my letterbox, you And cannot I cannot have it. another. Cannot. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, I refuse to log this and therefore refuse to give it any kind of star referencing at all. The bin. There you go. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I got a lot of joy, and this is going to come up in my weekly watches. I got a lot of joy from writing my review for The Meg, too. As in a sarcastic review. For I'm talking about just Barbie not being a film like so you can't even like register it like i choose not to because i choose not to run (laughs) i can't have this so-called film uh logged as a film that i participated in on my list of films because yeah i can't can't give star rating it's sure unworthy wow yeah with that (laughs) let's move on to our weekly watches I've done the same as last week. I have, Mm. over seven days, watched six films. Seven days, just like Craig David. Plus some crappy cartoon that we just talked about. Yeah, I, I, apparently I'd repressed it because I didn't know what you were talking about. For a so second. again, uh, no TV, uh, just all film for me Ooh, in the last More TV week. for me than yeah. film. Yeah, right. But you kick things off. I went and saw Asteroid City mm-hmm. uh, at the cinemas. New Wes Anderson film. Asteroid City. Yeah. Um, <laughs> good fun. Like, it was... What I wanted it to be, it's very Wes Anderson. You have certain clear expectations of what his films are going to look like, what their kind of moods are going to be, mm-hmm. like what level of levity. and A lot of beige. A lot of beige, yeah. uh, a lot of pastels, a lot of uh, framing with symmetry and stuff like that. Yep. Cast was awesome. Jason Schwartzman in the main uh, role is really good. Like he kind of changes his go-to character he's got a bit more of a rigid jaw in his delivery on it and i really like that and then there's a bit of heart to it there's some very funny moments so yeah asteroid city was a win for me it's not the best wes anderson i have ranked my wes anderson films in a list on my letterbox and it sat about six out of his 11 I think. okay but that's just to speak more highly of the other ones. Like, it was still very good. I'm not, like, a huge Wes Anderson fan. There are exceptions that I really like. Like, I love the Grand Budapest Hotel. Mm. But overall, I guess they're just not my sort of style. Yeah. And they're, they're very distinct in what they are. So... If you don't like a couple of them, you're pretty much not going to like them. Because they are yeah. all very, very similar yeah. in, in that way. Yeah, yeah. A, a media creator that has a very specific style that mm. you either like or you don't. Yeah. yeah. Yep. First one for me is a comedy special that you suggested for me. John Early, Now More Than Ever. And I really liked it. I uh, used it as a palate cleanser after Barbie last night. Mm. And I think I'd like to revisit it because it was quite late when I was watching it. But it's fun. Like, the music is a really nice way to break up the comedy. Yeah, yeah. So this is a HBO special for, like, a comedy special. HBO used to be the go-to place 
for comedy specials to be made. And John Early making it for HBO this time around, it really mixes up the, the, the form with those songs intersecting. I think he does three. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. like, they're not overly comedic the songs themselves like they are they're funny he's but sincere with his performance like for sure yeah but it, they don't need to be it's, it's kind of like a, a reprieve from the comedy yeah I love the middle one where he chooses the Britney Spears oh, song. so good. So good. And I won't say too much because, like, if you watch it, it's a lot of fun how he starts it as well. Yeah. But, yeah, like, I have loved John Early as a comedian for years now. He is very closely aligned with Tim Heidecker, does stuff with him. But you see him also in the show Search Party. He, 30 he's just, Rock as well. 30 Rock. Uh, he, he pops up in a bunch of different spots really great comedian so yeah I, good, good recommendation there i really enjoyed it now more than ever with john early uh second film for me rye lane it's a british rom-com it's a tight 90. tight like a tiger there it is uh, <laughs> and it's very similar to have you ever seen any of the before movies with ethan hawk before sunset oh before yeah sunrise yeah, yeah. before midnight i've seen so the, two of the three yeah i've seen two of the three as well and couldn't tell you which ones uh i've seen the first two i haven't seen the, the, the most recent one but supposedly it stands up as well but this film's kind of in the same vein where it's like you got the meat cute and then you've just got a day playing out where the two people People kind of build up affection for each other to the point of you know getting together it's funny it's easy really kind of funny situations they find themselves in along the, the way as well um so yeah it, it's it was good rye lane nice i did a few tv shows this week i finished off the second season of from i won't really talk about it too much because i have talked about it previously but i would say that if you are watching from you get some answers at the end of the second season so it is worth persevering the frustrating part of that is as soon as you start getting answers, you're like, oh, great, now we're getting something. And then the season's over, so we got to wait. And by the time season three comes around, I will have lost interest again. Mm. So I, I think it does suffer from pacing issues, but at least it did give something away. But another TV show that I was watching is called The Cleaner. Greg Davies, he's a British comedian. He is the Taskmaster in the British version of Taskmaster. And basically in this show, he is a crime scene cleaner. There's a couple of minor characters that come in and out, but he's the only consistent character in each episode. But every episode, there's a guest star that kind of knew one of the victims or is somehow at the, the scene of the crime when he's doing the cleanup and he kind of bonds with them over the course of the episode and then it moves on and in the next episode, it's a brand new person. So every episode is kind of fresh and different, but he's hilarious in it because he is a crime scene cleaner. He's obviously very desensitized to the violence of it all. A woman killed her husband. What, with a combine harvester? Stabbed him 38 times. Why? To piss me off? You only need five stabs. Anything else is showboating. Two seasons of that. Really, really funny moments. But there's also some moments with a lot of heart as well. But yeah, worth checking out, especially if you like British comedy. The Cleaner. Very good. I'll reel off two movies as they both came out in the year 2005. So I thought that'd be a nice pairing. Thank You for Smoking. So You're welcome. <laughs> Thank You for Smoking is a film by the son of Ivan Reitman, Jason Reitman. Uh, so Ivan Reitman was the director of one, you know, film that I kind of consider to be okay called Ghostbusters. <laughs> uh, and then Jason Reitman is his son who ended up directing the most recent Ghostbusters, mm -hmm. but his first feature length film was Thank You for Smoking. It stars Aaron Eckhart as a lobbyist for tobacco in America. And it, it's a comedy, but it also has some really nice social commentary about what it means to persuade mm -hmm. and what it means to lobby or be an advocate for something that is inherently bad. Right? Tagline, I ain't afraid of no smokes. <laughs> Very good. Um, so, yeah, I had seen this film a couple of times before, but really enjoyed revisiting it. So that was Thank You for Smoking. I think it's a lot of fun. The other one from 2005 is A Very Different Tone, A History of Violence. So oh, great film. Cronenberg, David Cronenberg. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I get mixed up because his son's making films now as well. Films. Yeah. <laughs> Better than did, you see, did you see his ranked as my worst film of the year? Worst film. Yeah. Worse than Barbie. 
This that's not a film release. Okay, year. good, very yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, right. No, I haven't seen that yet. Anyway. Certainly worse than twenty twenty three Barbie. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> oh, I agree with that. So, A History of Violence by David Cronenberg, 2005, stars Viggo Morgensen as a small town businessman who, I don't want to say too much because going into this film without knowing what it's about is kind of important. Mm. So, yeah, he comes into some confrontation. Yeah, yeah. a lot of twists and turns. Yeah, part. part of what I love about this film is the tight naughtiness of it. Tight like a tiger. <laughs> uh, then pushes Cronenberg to really condense the story into something that is just focused on the events. Mm. So it takes place over, I think, two, three days in total. Really, really strong storytelling in mm -hmm. this film. Awesome tension building. Again, a great cast. So that's a history of violence. Next TV show for me, I watched, not in its entirety yet, but I watched most of season two of The Lincoln Lawyer. You seen the movie? Nope. Oh, okay. So um, the movie came out, oh, I don't even know when it came out, but there was a Matthew McConaughey movie called The Lincoln Lawyer that was based on one of the books. I'm not sure which book it was. I had always hoped they were going to make sequel movies based on the other Lincoln Lawyer books. I, I think they were in talks for a while, but then Matthew McConaughey ended up doing other projects and just kind of fizzled out. All right, all right, all right. But now they've got two seasons on Netflix and they're great. They're really, really good. If it's not Matthew McConaughey playing the Lincoln Lawyer, who is? Like Manuel Garcia Rulfo. 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 I don't Very know good. if I'm pronouncing that right. Comment at me if I'm not. But the characters are just great in it. Yeah, like Angus Sampson. Aussie actor. Angus Sampson, an Australian who, when he tries to do his American accent, ends up sounding British. Yes. He talks like this. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen him do that a few times. Neve Campbell, who I adore. Oh, okay. Good characters. Really, really intriguing. Like, I like the elements of law. He's a defense attorney, so I like the way that he manages to get his clients off for certain things. But he also has a moral compass as well. So sometimes he ends up defending people that he finds out have committed crimes. And then that's a whole issue as well. So, yes, yeah, it's, it's a really, really interesting story about like the ethics of it, but also like the code of the lawyer and what he can and can't do. And yeah, it's really intriguing. Great, great show. Lincoln Lawyer. Very good. Back to some more recent film releases for me. I've got two more. One of them was a film called Polite Society. Mm. So, again, a British film. Uh, this one is two Pakistani uh, sisters, well, um, British Pakistani sisters, and it's a comedy that is about one sister is getting married and the other sister wants to stop her because she doesn't want to lose her sister from, you know, being her best friend. Tale as old as time. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds pretty kind of conventional in that sense, but the way it's put forward is so much fun. Like, I had... A good run with this film it reminded me of kick-ass in terms of the tone and like there's there's fight scenes in it because okay. um the younger sister wants to become a stunt person fight scenes kind of like a scott pilgrim-esque cut in oh, yeah. there so the editing's really fun it's just got a lively energy to it um i really recommend this film polite okay. polite society yeah, yeah right yeah, yeah good fun one more tv show for me twisted metal uh, you might have seen it advertised i have it's based on a game, a PlayStation game, which is essentially kind of like a, a racing slash fighting game in cars. There's not a whole lot of racing slash fighting in cars. I mean, there's aspects of it, but they've taken the source material and then adapted it quite heavily for this television series because they've got fully fleshed out characters and things like that. Like I've never played the game, but I did a little bit of research into it and apparently they've taken a lot of liberties with Well, I mean close. if the game is just essentially what you said it was, which is fighting in cars. Yeah. How like can you, yeah, how can you get like an eight episode series? That <laughs> that being said <laughs> that being said, I watched the full season. It's it's good fun. Like the characters are fun. Post apocalyptic world. Will Arnett is doing the voice oh, of one of the okay. characters. <laughs> He's not the actual person who's playing the character, but because they wear a mask the whole time he can do the voice behind it and he is having a ball because it's a really threatening character mm. but he's like this goofy clown he's dark but he's like making lots of jokes and he, he likes performing and yeah it's very very amusing but it looks like they're setting up for a second season where it's going to be like a tournament a racing tournament okay and so that might resemble the game more right perhaps but yeah good fun again starred one neve campbell as well uh, it's got Anthony Mackie in it, Stephanie Beatrice, who plays Rosa in Brooklyn Nine-Nine. A very, very strong cast. Twisted Metal, you should check it out. Cool. So, I did end my run of six for the week with a flop. Mm. And that is Oppenheimer. Whoa! Hot take alert. 
Um, so that is hot. That's like you dropped an A bomb. I bought my ticket to see this at IMAX about a month. Sorry, <laughs> recognition is there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, I, I was too set, setting myself up for the the, the takedown. So. <laughs> I saw this at IMAX yesterday after having bought my ticket about a month ago. Mm -hmm. uh, very excited for it. Generally, I like Nolan films, although Tenet was a convoluted pile of mess. Exposition yeah. that you couldn't hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I then sat through the three hours. Did you say you saw this yesterday? I saw this yesterday. So, you had two watches that were a struggle yesterday. Correct. Yeah, so getting home after watching this and then knowing I had to also watch Barbie That's Charm rough. School, it was rough. For the three hours, the dialogue heavy, expositional again, I didn't care. We talked about this last week with June. You talk about June. Dean. 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 Guess put the team. <laughs> Guess put the Dean. What compels a seemingly normal human being to do something like that? Gotta support the team. Uh, where, you, you know, it, it's all well and good to go off in these different ways, provided your audience cares about the character. Yeah. And I just did not care for one Oppenheimer, one bit. Love Killian Murphy. I recently watched The Wind in the Bali, and he's amazing in it. So it's not him, it's just the character. I did not care at all. And then to sit through three hours, it is a lot of characters talking about things in this film. A lot. This is interesting because Ethan said, Sir, don't go see it. He liked it. He really liked it. But he said, Sir, don't go see it. You're not going to like it. So I think he's worried. I'll tell him how much I don't like it and ruin it for him. Whereas he's like, Mr. Whittle can go see it. He'll like it. <laughs> well, you were wrong, Ethan. Yeah, he yeah. didn't like um, it. I did not. I'm surprised that I didn't like it. I expected to like it. Mm. Um, and there's certainly parts that, like, it's beautifully shot. Some of the, the shots are just exceptional, beautiful things. There's, it's not enough, though. No, it's not. Like, and the whole tension build and the way he uses sound, it's like, it's now gotten to a point of cliche for Nolan films. Yeah, I didn't enjoy my experience with Oppenheimer. Mm. Mm. Oh, that's a shame. But, you know, five out of six ain't bad in terms that's of uh, films That's true, as for the, the old week. song goes. Yes, that's how it goes. Yeah. yeah. My final two are both films of 2023. I made it to the theater twice in the last week. One of them is ranking very, very high on my list of 2023 films. One of them is ranking very, very low on my list of 2023 <laughs> Please films. Please say the right one. Through the <laughs> the Meg category. is the low one. Right, okay, and yeah, Barbie yeah, yeah. is yeah. sitting very close to the top of the list. So I actually made a new list on my letterbox ranking all of the films that I've watched that have been released this year. Mm. Quite a lot of them I'm watching now so that you and I can discuss them. Well, I, I separately run a list of all the films that either have come out in, in the year or one that will come out in the year. Yeah, I like right. to keep a very detailed list. Yeah, I, I can appreciate that. Yeah, in terms of ranking the films this year, I've, I've got I've done a separate rank as I'd well. I'd love for you to make a list and, and also have a look at my one and see what you think. But um, yes, I wrote a, a very sarcastic review of The Meg. I purposely went to The Meg to the trench knowing it was going to be a terrible film and knowing that I would get joy out of the fact that it was going to be a terrible film. Mm. I went to the first one with my friend Monaghan. Uh, we went to this one together. We booked it in. We love just watching bad CGI sharks and Jason Statham. We love it. Yeah, even though I, I took the piss out of it in my review, I thoroughly enjoyed watching it, but it was a terrible film. Do you think that the experience of the cinema really kind of contributed to... To my enjoyment of it? Yeah. In my review, it starts with the audience applauded when the film finished, and they genuinely did. Oh, right. They, look, it wasn't a full crowd in the yeah, theatre yeah. uh, by any means, but they did actually clap at the end of it. I, I think it definitely helped. I would say out of the two of them, I enjoyed the first film more. They were on the surface and in boats and things like that. This one, they spend a good chunk of the film underwater, kind of like submarine style uh, dive suits, that sort of stuff. And I don't find that as interesting. Like you watch it to see a man go against a giant shark, yeah. not like people just wandering around on the bottom of the ocean. So I didn't enjoy it as much because in that way, it didn't have as many of the hilarious scenes where people just get attacked. But it makes up for it in the final act because they end up on a fun island. And you're never going to believe what this fun island is called. Fun island? It sure is. Is it really? Yeah. <laughs> and it's just people getting completely massacred by sharks and octopuses and things like that. Octopi? Uh, yeah. Octo yeah, octopi. I think that's actually right. 
Oh, there you go. Yeah. Now I'm hungry for octopi. <laughs> um, but in mm, contrast pie. to that, Barbie, it got a glowing review from me. I really, really enjoyed it. I spoke on my letterbox about how I think it's a really good film in terms of bridging a gap and an understanding between people's experiences. Not everyone's going to connect to it in the same way. I've seen a lot of criticism for heavy-handed messaging in it, but I feel like that's kind of the point. Like, because they're playing toys, they can be a little bit cartoonish about the way that they present the message as well and their ignorance of the world because they're so far removed from it because yeah. they're, they're toys. The, the level of ignorance that they have is believable. Yeah. yeah. So when lots of people are like, oh, I feel like it's really hammering home the message, it's like, yeah, but that's okay. You can hammer home the message. It's satirizing it in a lot of ways. Yes. And so I think because of that, that's how they, they get away with it. Mm. I thought it was really good that the actual Barbie world showed how it was kind of the reverse and it made the guys objects in that world almost as a way to broach people who didn't quite understand. Mm. And yeah, I just, I thought it was really clever. I thought it was very funny and it had some really, really sweet moments as well um i loved i loved the speech that was used to kind of break the hypnosis of some of the characters i thought that was very real and raw and again that's something that people have said oh that was so like on the nose and it's like yeah but it was just it was really sobering well i the the word that came out when i've left the film like it's the film is very confronting for sure and it's confronting in different ways depending on who you are, right? So, yeah. you know, if you are someone who finds the values that the film is putting forward conflicting with your own, of course you're going to go, it's heavy-handed mm. or it's over the top. That, that confrontation is good. It's good, That's yeah. That's part of what I think the film is trying to say is the conversation matters. It's okay for us to be in conflict provided we talk about it, you know, like provided we consider the nuance of difference, you know? I, I, I like that about the film. Yeah, and yeah. you mentioned how it was the catalyst for a lot of conversations that you've had so since much, then. Yep. And yeah, I, I feel exactly the same way. It's really cool to be able to just address that sort of stuff. And everyone's experience is different and some people might have had harder experiences than others. But just the fact that you can watch a film like that and go, there are people out there who experience things that I never have to deal with. Mm. Like, that's a really cool thing to just be aware of at the end of a film. So in, in that way, I, I thought it was really, really powerful. And I really liked it. I, really I liked it. coincidentally, at lunchtime today, caught up with Miss Traher and she and I were talking about how it's a film worthy of a, a rewatch. Like, because oh, for sure. you don't... You take away so much in the first one, but I think there's more. I actually plan to go back and see it. Oh, well, yeah. I imagine as part of your watching of the entire Barbie-verse, you're going to have to revisit yeah, it. Yeah, like, so I'd watch this one at the end after watching the 105 other films first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You call them films? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Slip of the tongue. And with that, we will move on to our tantalizing trailers. Trailers. got three tantalizing trailers but i'm gonna kick one out very very quickly vacation friends 2 now i'm only mentioning it because i watched it yeah i've got one of those i didn't realize there was a vacation friends 1 i didn't know that film existed and after seeing the trailer for vacation friends 2 i think i know why i might have ignored that first film mm. it looks pretty awful John Cena is in it. If you know the caliber of film that John Cena tends to make. Well, he was in Barbie. Oh, he was. He was yeah, a merman he was a at the merman, end. Man. Yeah. Merman. Merman. Yeah, that's got to be one of those cameos where people were just begging to be in the film by yeah. the end of it. Yep. I like the story. I don't know if you saw Michael Sarah. We ended up just turning this back into a conversation about Barbie. Well, the whole podcast is meant to be. That's true. Movie. Yeah, Michael Sarah said that his agent had been contacted by Greta Gerwig saying, oh, will he play this role? And his agent said something like, oh, I, I don't know if he's going to want to travel to shoot it. He's, he's probably not going to be interested. And then when Michael Sarah found out, he was like, what? And then he contacted Greta Gerwig personally. And he was like, can I still be in this? <laughs> so Vacation Friends 2, just, just don't. 
Yeah. Just, just don't. Speaking of don't, um, don't send your friends a link to a film trailer without actually having watched the trailer first. Like, so I sent you a link to The Forest Hills. You'll be happy to know I didn't watch it. No, no, I know you didn't. But... <laughs> well, it sounds like that was but, a good but, thing that I didn't yeah, watch yeah, it. Yeah, it was um, based on the fact that it has Shelley Duvall. Oh, I need to get this right. You can edit this out. If I say f- and you have to edit it. Ah, oh, he's got me. <laughs> Shelley Duvall. I was correct the first time. So you know Shelley. what? I'm going to leave that in and just bleep it <laughs> so that people know that that's what you've done. Behind the scenes of the podcast. Shelley Duvall of The Shining fame. Oh, cool. Um, Eddie Furlong from Terminator 2. Mm-hmm. He's also in this. Dee Wallace of E.T., the mother in E.T., mm-hmm. who a couple of weeks ago we talked about a great performance. It was nothing like that, penis breath. Hell yet. Yep. So with those credits on the film, I'm like, even if it's B-grade, it'll still be cool to see these actors uh, performing. Anyway, I actually sat through the two and a half minute trailer. Mm-hmm. Woof. 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 It is not one I will be watching. Don't tell me you also watched this yesterday. Three slogs in the one day. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Woof. Woof indeed. How come no one ever meows? Uh, Boy, was it a slog. Meow. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting to that time of the podcast. Mm-hmm. The next one on my list is a film called Uproar. So it is a coming of age film. So it's about kind of finding your place in the world. Julian Dennison. So he was in the Deadpool film. He was in Hunt for the Wilder People. He's the main kid in Hunt for the okay. Wilder People. I think it's about him moving to a new town and he can't really find his place in it. He joins the drama club. Uh, Reese Darby is his drama teacher. So that's going to be hilarious. But also there's sort of protests going on within the town. So it's about him kind of embracing his like Maori heritage yep. and just sort of finding himself in that too and considering things that he's been quite apathetic to previously. So yeah, it, it looks like a good mix of drama and comedy. Yeah, I'm, I'm up for checking that out. Yeah. Uh, next one for me was a TV series called A Million Miles Away. So this is an Apple original TV series that has Michael Pena playing the main astronaut who wants to get up and um, go astronauting. Is that what it's called? Yeah, when you go into space? It... Uh, go up astronauting, yes. Go up astronauting, yes. yes. That all is the, the technical the terms yep. on the Fifth Period podcast. That's it. And all the challenges he faces doing so. It looks like a big production, like a lot of money has been thrown in it to tell this. I believe it's a somewhat true story, a million miles away. It looks really strong, like a good drama. It's an overcoming of race, like inherent racism and stuff like that, systemic racism. But yeah, like it looks like it's going to not be bad. It's a glowing recommendation. It's going to not be bad. Well, there's always that reluctance, right? Where it's like, the trailer looks good, you know, and then your voice kind of goes up because the trailer looked all right. Yeah. Anyway, speaking of, I think you and I have got the same third final one. Scott Pilgrim? Yes. Ah, so this one goes out to We come Tal- full circle. Yeah, it goes out to Talia and uh, Hannah after they talked about Scott Pilgrim. Now we can talk about it. So there is an animated Netflix series coming out for Scott Pilgrim. And it is getting all of the original voice casts from the movie. And when you say all of them, it's all of them. Like, you look at the credits on on IMDb, they have got all of them coming back. Scott Pilgrim Takes Off is what the show is called. Yeah, so the animation looks very similar to the comics. Yeah. um, Which is going to be interesting, too, because the comics don't look identical to the versions in the film either. They kind of redesigned some of their looks and things for the film. So it'll be interesting seeing their original designs with the voices of the cast from the film. Yes. Do they even have the vegan police in it? So I wasn't vegan. It's milk and eggs, bitch. No vegan diet, no vegan powers. I can't recall. Oh my that, gosh, that would that would make my day. Yeah. But yeah, I, I'm so stoked they're all coming back. Edgar Wright is also coming back to direct. It's going to be awesome. Mm-hmm. It's going to be good. And yeah. even you're not... That partial to my animation, but you got to get behind this. Surely. Well, I love the film. The, and, and part of what made that film is how good the actors were in it. It's a bumper cast. Mm. So, yeah, really excited to see them all come together for... Hopefully there's some new kind of comedy in it. Like, the trailer does come across like it's a very strong recreation of the film uh, with the scenes, that, but maybe that's just scenes they've selected to include in the trailer. I'm, I'm hoping there's a, an expansion on the story and the, the world of Scott Pilgrim in the show. I assume there would be. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. you'd hope so, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's everything for today. Hopefully we've done the Barbie fans justice. Oh, you don't really care. 
Uh, no, the Barbie film. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like we spent a good portion of time talking about that Barbie film. Well, which but is really isn't good. it nice that we ended up doing both of them on the same yes, episode? Yes, it is. Yeah. As always, we do remind you guys to be liking, subscribing, sharing things around, commenting, all of that stuff. Another reminder that we're very, very close to announcing our winners of the Code Word competition. Mm. So if you haven't had a chance to go back and listen to some of the old podcasts and start to save those code words, we are going to be announcing it in the podcast next week. So if you want to come talk to us at Film Club on Friday and let us know how many of those code words you know, you are in the running to be put in a future poster for an upcoming episode. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just, you're done. <laughs> I don't want to be, but I am. That's all right. And on that note, here's a special track I wrote myself. I hope you like it. We rule this school. We rule this school. Bobby back. Thanks very much, guys. See you later.